Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Philip Phillips, and I'm the Associate Dean of the University Honors College. And I'm pleased to welcome you to our Honors Lecture Series on Global Engagement. Uh, today, uh, we have a special uh, pre presentation by one of our uh, very own students who's going to talk to us about her thesis and about the, the process that she went through and share any helpful tips that she can and give you an opportunity to ask questions. And the same will be the case next week when we have uh, three students here talking about their projects. Leslie Sweeten is a former valedictorian of Warren County High School. She is a Buchanan Fellow, a member of Omicron Delta Kappa, and an active member of both her home church and her church here in Murfreesboro. Leslie is an English major with a concentration in secondary education, uh, and she's one of our honors students who participated in the Honors in Italy program, and that's when I first got to know her. Uh, she hopes either to uh, further her education by attending seminary or uh, teaching for a year and then attending seminary. The title of her creative project is The Women Who Made Me. Uh, and it is a fascinating work, really interesting, and I look forward to hearing more about it. Please join me in welcoming Leslie. Okay, I'm going to preface all of this by saying I've had a rather nasty cold for the past few days, so if my voice goes in and out, that's why. And I just want to thank Dr. Phillips and Dean Vile again for having me here and introducing my project. And it is, it's entitled The Women Who Made Me, and it's a creative work. And I'll just start with the basics of what exactly the project is. Um, it's a collection of short stories based on four matrilineal generations in my family, and that might sound kind of confusing, what is a matrilineal generation? Basically, I wrote a story about my mom, my two grandmothers, and my four great-grandmothers. And I call this inspired fiction, and it's kind of something my advisor and I came up with, just to kind of give it a label because we didn't know exactly what to call it. And um, basically what that means is the stories are true, but clearly I didn't have the exact dialogue that happened in each scenario. I didn't have every single detail. So I went in and I filled in the gaps. I wrote the dialogue. I added some details. I fabricated a few things, a few characters, just to give the stories a little more life. But the premise and the basic um, plot of each story is a true story. And um, like I said in this bottom point, I knew some of the basic details before I went into the writing process because obviously these women are my own family members. <clears throat> so I knew facts about their lives, I knew stories about their lives, but in order to gain the details and get some inspiration to fill in those gaps, I conducted what I called interviews with each woman, and that's way more formal than it really was. It was like sitting over a cup of coffee, talking about their lives, talking about how they got from point A to point B and what their lives looked like, who, who were the important people in their lives, that kind of thing. And I used that information to supplement my prior knowledge. And in the case where the woman I was writing a story about was no longer living, which, is, which was the case for each of my four great-grandmothers, I interviewed the child of hers, who is my grandparent. So to better explain that, like my great-grandmother, um, whom I called Ninny, who in the stories, uh, her name is Ruth, um, I interviewed her, grand, well, her son, who is my grandfather. So I tried to keep the links as close as possible so I could get the information that was most closely linked to me, but also most clo closely linked to the woman I was writing about. Uh, a few things I had to consider when writing. Um, historiography, if you never encountered this term, which before I started writing, I never encountered this term myself, Merriam-Webster defines as the writing of history, especially the writing of history based on the critical examination of sources the selection of particulars from the authentic materials and the synthesis of particulars into a narrative that will stand the test of critical methods. <clears throat> Basically what that means is synthesizing, synthesizing fact, actual occurrences, authentic materials into a narrative format. And that's what my entire project was about. I had to synthesize what I knew as truth, what I had 
um, found to be true based on the, um, the oral narratives of my family members and the, in many cases I compared the facts to like I went to the places these women were born so I got to see like um, a graduation picture from this city for this woman. So I was able to like rather than just go by word of mouth I was able to um, make these facts a little more solid to prove that they're they're true. So I had to synthesize that but I also had to synthesize the narration aspect of it so I took what was given me by the people I was interviewing and I put my own spin on it so I narrated it through my own voice but my voice was based on the voice of others if that makes sense. Another thing <coughs> I considered when writing was pathos, pathos, pathos. That was my that was my war cry for this, for this collection of short stories, really, because this was a very deeply emotionally connected project for me, obviously, because I wrote about my mom, I wrote about my great-grandmothers, I wrote about my grandmothers, and thankfully I was very blessed in my life to know every woman that I wrote about except for um, one of my great-grandmothers who passed away before I was born. So this was very personal because I knew these women and they influenced me in like miraculous ways. So writing about them, I had the very unique task of translating the meaning that they carry for me into the meaning that I want others to take from it. And that's one thing I tried to incorporate into the project was the fact that yes, these women are connected to me, but they're also connected to everybody else because everyone has people like this. Maybe they're not their mother, they're not their grandmother, their great-grandmother, but there's somebody for somebody. So I wanted to translate that fact that we can gather inspiration from ordinary women. We can gather inspiration from ordinary people. It doesn't have to be someone that everyone knows about for us to gather meaning from their lives. Another thing <coughs> I had to consider when writing was revision, revision, revision. And my thesis advisor, she, her, her mantra is revision. When I took her class, we anything we wrote in her class, we had to revise multiple times. And at first, I thought that was a bit of a burden coming into a project that ended up being 140 pages long, which is what my project ended up being. Revising 140 pages is no easy task. But thankfully, my advisor helped me. Um, we cut, a, cut it into chunks. And each story, I wrote seven stories, they're 15 pages a piece, give or take a page or two. And so I went, I wrote each story, I wrote the entire project, I stuck it all together, and then we started uh, revising it piece by piece. So I would look at a story that I maybe wrote a couple months ago, and I would go back and think, okay, this doesn't work, this sentence doesn't mesh well with this sentence, something doesn't make sense here, and then I would re revise it. Then I'd look at the next story and do the same thing over and over again for the seven stories. And the more I revised each story, the more it kind of seemed to blend into a cohesive collection of stories. And another unique thing about this is I took on a project of writing short stories and I'd never written a short story before prior to this project. So as my advisor and I got to reviewing the stories towards the end of the project, as the uh, October 23rd deadline was approaching, we kind of realized that the stories that I wrote in the end, like towards the end of the project, were much better than the ones I wrote at the beginning. So the ones I wrote at the beginning required a lot more revision than the ones at the end, but that's to be expected because as I was writing this, I was learning how to write a short story. I was learning what works in terms of plot, in terms of conclusion, in terms of connection. So in terms of dialogue, that was another big thing that I had to work on because as unless we are specifically taking creative writing courses, even English majors, we rarely encounter dialogue. So writing dialogue was something I had to also work a lot with and develop that skill, especially in these um, the stories that I wrote because most of these women are from Appalachia so there's a certain dialect, there's a certain like slang, there's a certain uh, phrasing that goes with each of these women's words so I had to try to incorporate that into the dialogue aspect that I was already trying to learn how to write. So that also came into the revision process and um, <clears throat> excuse me <coughs> 
so we had dialogue, conclusion, plot, all of those good things into the revision process. And then I came to writing like the introduction, which is, in terms of the stories, wasn't as, it wasn't as connected emotionally or um, creatively, but for the terms of the thesis project, I wrote an introduction that explained my methodology, explained like the interview process, explained the um, academ academic component of the project, and I also included some biographical material at the end of the project. Aside from the stories, I included, um, I included pictures of each woman, and I included basic facts, where she was born, who she married, how many children she had, what were those children's names, what jobs did she hold in her lifetime, that kind of thing. And that brings me just to my last, sli my last slide, the women. I had Ivora Walling. She was my great-grandmother. Um, she was my mom's dad's mom. Beulah Cole, my great-grandmother, was my dad's mom's mom. Ruth Sweeten, my great-grandmother, was my dad's dad's mom. Then Violet Boring, my great-grandmother, was my mom's mom's mom. And you can see how this was quickly getting really confusing when I was trying to um, lay out in my methodology how I interviewed, who I interviewed, and what the connections were. Then it got a little simpler as I got to my great-grandmother's, or I mean my grandmother's. Judy Walling was my mom's mom. Lena Raymond was my dad's mom. Then Valerie Sweeten was my mom. So in terms of that, that's the... Thankfully, that's the most complicated it gets in terms of like numbers and connections and things like that because I was not about to write a research thesis, creative all the way for me. So this was, this was about my level of complexity there. But um, thankfully, like I mentioned earlier, I knew each of these women, at least in some form or fashion, except for Violet but I spoke with her granddaughter, or not her granddaughter, her daughter, who is Judy. And so my grandmother, but her daughter, and I was able to gather a lot of information about her life that way. And another um, really interesting aspect that emerged for me during the writing of this project that I didn't really anticipate was the connection between the stories. I don't know why it didn't really dawn on me beforehand, but I originally thought each story was going to be about that woman specifically. But as I kept writing, I realized that, for example, Violet emerged in Judy's story. And in Valerie's story, Judy emerged. So we had those like cross connections of writing each woman into the other woman's story. So I had like, I wrote about Judy when she was, I think 18 years old, but in my mom's story, she, she came in as a 40-year-old. So I had to think of Judy as an 18-year-old, and I had to think of her as a 40-year-old. In Beulah's story, I wrote, a, I wrote about her as a 75-year-old, and then I had to consider Lena, her daughter, who is about 50 at the time. But in Lena's story, I wrote about her as being about 45. So I had a lot of a lot of different crossing between each woman in different stages of her life that I had to consider. So that was a lot of me gathering specific information, personality traits, what did this woman look like at this time, what was she doing at this time, and that sort of thing. But as a whole, this is, this is basically what my project is. If you have any questions about it, I would love to answer them. If you have any questions about the process, I would also love to answer those to the best of my ability because I'm still technically in it. My final final isn't due until December 6th. So, any questions? How many times would you say that you revised the whole thing? <laughs> oh gosh. Um, in terms of chunking it all together and revising the entire thing, probably about two times, but because it was so, the nature of the project is very um, split up, so the different stories I, w I revised multiple times before putting it all together and then going through literally reading the entire project at least twice and then reviews, like revising that. But like I said, before I put it all together, I revised each story multiple times. Yeah? 
Um, as you're writing these, um, as you're writing these stories, you're telling someone else's story. You're not. They're connected to you, but it's um, it's something completely different. I'm writing my. I'm actually going through like the first um, versions of my revisions right now on my thesis, and I'm doing the same thing. I'm writing songs mm -hmm. um, about um, veterans' oral history. So, how did you kind of like mentally distinguish? You have um, like biases and expectations about these women. How did you kind of like separate yourself from that to give an accurate story as a historian, but also have that emotional content? Because it is. It's very emotional right. because these yeah. are. Um, big women in your life. So how did you kind of right. um, that fight was, between those two? That was, that's a really great point. That was something that my advisor and I kind of, um, at the culmination of it all, and kind of throughout the process to realize that I had a tendency to even the dirty parts kind of brush them up, make it look a little nicer, just because, you know, it's my grandma or it's my mom. I don't want to make her look bad. I don't want to make make her seem like a terrible person. So I did have a tendency to kind of shine things up a little bit. So one thing that we had to work on in the revision process was kind of making things a little more raw, a little more real. And I had to separate myself from the position of granddaughter or daughter and look at it as in person to person, author to character, that kind of thing. So with it being a creative thesis, uh, do you have a work cited, and if so, what type of resources were you using um, throughout this project that you cited? Mm -hmm. Okay, so in terms of work cited, um, my introduction, like I had that definition. That was one thing I included in my work cited. I also, um, my thesis proposal was a little more academic sounding than the process or then the product ended up being just because the bulk of the creative thesis was the creative work but in the introduction I included um, like this this definition and then there's a man named Hayden White who um, he speaks he writes on historiography and I used some of his theory and his methodology in my introduction and I talked I spoke about that and there's also another woman I can't think of her name right now but I also spoke about some of her theory on revision, included that in my introduction, and then I just went into the creative work after the introduction. So that was the work side, and just a few things that supported my theory. Yeah. And thank you. And what, how long was the introduction part of your work? Um, I think my introduction ended up being about five pages, but like I said, I still have a few more revisions to actually do before I submit my final. So I've, I'm kind of looking at polishing that a little bit more. I don't know if it'll add more length, but I'll probably clarify some of my theory and methodology a little more. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, uh, what you wrote about your family. Mm -hmm. uh, are, they, did they, are they excited? They, did they want to read it? Have they read it? Um, uh, did, could you talk about mm -hmm. kind of their reaction or what you think your reactions would be if they haven't read it. Right. Well, my, and a lot of it has to do with personality and interest. Like, um, one of my grandmothers is super pumped about it all. She was ready to give me every piece of information I wanted. She wanted to go back, like, generations and <laughs> map all of my family history. So she was totally on board and excited with it. Um, another one of my grandmothers, she was willing to give me every piece of information that I wanted. She, she was ready to relay her life story, but she's not as much about reading herself. So I'm not sure if she's exactly excited about reading it. She knows what the purpose is. Everyone knew what the purpose is and was okay with everything. As far as who's read some so far, my mother has read some so far. She did remark that it was pretty funny to read about her own life story, kind of like an out-of-body experience but they were all on board and very supportive of all of it, or else I wouldn't have even approached the project the way I did. Do you have a favorite passage you could read to us? Uh, yeah, I have some, I have right here a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so this is the Beulah story. Um, let's see here. And the Beulah story is 
it was one of the ones I wrote later in the process, so personally I think it's a little better than some of the ones I wrote earlier in the process. Um, the, I can read a little bit of it and try not to give away what I'm reading. I'll speak a little bit about it or to it after I read it. But this story, the way it begins, Beulah, she's about 75 years old. She's living on her own. Um, she is survived by four children, but she doesn't live super close to any of them. She, she lives in the same town as one of them. Her husband passed away several years back. He was a, a pretty controlling man. And for the first time in her life, at 75 years old, she feels like she's gained freedom. And that's basically where this story um, enters. And like I said, these are only like 15-page stories, so they're just little tiny snippets of the entire lives of these women. And where we enter at this story, uh, Beulah is at the grocery store. She um, walks from her apartment to the Dollar General. That's a few blocks down the road and she goes to buy her groceries and then she walks back to her apartment because she loves the freedom because she never was allowed to grocery shop before because her, hu her husband was very controlling. So I'll go ahead and enter right here. Um, Beulah didn't expect to be at the store for very long today because she didn't have very many things to get. She needed some boring things like soap and paper towels but she also planned on getting a few items to treat herself. Beulah loved fudge striped cookies and she kept her kitchen stocked with them at all times. They were a staple in her diet, as was coffee. The two went so well, or went together so well. Adding the fudge stripes to her cart reminded Beulah that she needed to buy more coffee too. She always looked for the blue canister. That's the kind Lena, and you learn earlier in the story that Lena is her daughter. Lena had at her house and Beulah liked that kind. So that's the kind she started buying for herself when she moved into her apartment. She wasn't sure what it was called, but she knew it was in a blue can. She searched the shelves for a minute until she found the blue canister. She looked at the front to make sure there was a picture of coffee on it before putting it in her cart. She didn't want to be buying something that wasn't coffee. Beulah also needed to buy laundry detergent. The kind she usually bought came in a blue jug and it had a picture of sheets blowing on a clothesline on it. Beulah went to aisle five and searched for it. She looked, taking her time, but she couldn't find it. While she was standing there, a store employee walked a walked by a couple of times. Seeing that Beulah had been standing there for several minutes, the girl offered a piece of advice. I like Gain. It gets my clothes clean and it smells pretty good. What does it look like? asked Beulah. Replying nonchalantly, the girl said, I'm not sure. There are lots of different kinds. You can read the labels though and it'll tell you what it smells like and what it does. Beulah paused at this. She decided to ask again but rephrased the question. What does the kind you get look like? The girl hesitated a little, but then answered, I think it's orange, maybe. Beulah looked at the shelf and saw lots of orange jugs. Some of them had the same picture on the front, but some of them didn't. She wasn't sure which one to pick, but seeing the girl standing there, she took a guess and pulled one off the shelf. Invested now, the Dollar General employee stood there and waited to make sure the elderly lady standing in aisle five got detergent, got a detergent she was happy with. The girl watched with curiosity as Beulah hesitated in pulling a jug off the shelf. Beulah stared for a few minutes, eyes scanning the various brands, but she ended up pulling off some no-name brand fabric softener instead of the suggested gain detergent. Ma'am, were you looking for detergent or fabric softener? Because that's fabric softener. Oh, replied Beulah. <clears throat> she held the jug up and looked at it. I meant to get the detergent. The young girl laughed politely. Thinking the woman old and possibly a little senile, she walked over to the shelf and grabbed the orange gain detergent. Here you go, ma'am. You'll have to let me know how you like it. Thank you, I will, replied Beulah. The girl smiled at Beulah and walked off. One would think things like that would happen to Beulah more often than they did, but she had learned all the tricks to managing her illiteracy. In a world where everything was in print, the inability to read created problems. But from years of practice, Beulah knew how to combat these problems. And that's just a little section of the Beulah story. And one thing I really like about that story is just the rawness of it. The fact that Beulah is 75 years old and she can't read. And she's in a grocery store. And she has to rely on colors and pictures to be able to buy her groceries. And this is a true story. She, my great-grandmother, never learned how to read or write. And you learn 
later in the story that the reason she doesn't know how to read or write is because she went to school when she was, I don't know, five or six when you start school. And because she was so poor, she had no shoes, she didn't have very nice clothes, the other kids made fun of her and it was, they were ruthless, so she never went back to school. So she never learned how to read or write. And that's just part of the Beulah story and that's just one of the seven stories that make up this collection. Um, any other questions? Thank you, Leslie.